e4, and we've been playing the Karokan, but this time let's play the Alakine. I've heard some rumblings about the Alakine. We'll play the Alakine. It's positional enough where it passes the test. Okay, knight, knight, c3. Now, the proper Alakine-esque way to play here is not e5, which transposes to the Vienna. You could do that, expected loan, but actually d5. So you might be like, but isn't this the Scandi? Well, it's a really good Scandi. Because if white trades everything on d5, he no longer will have a b1 knight to put on c3. So it's an improved version. This equalizes. e5. Okay, that's the main line. Here, it, you know, you kind of have to have experience in this line to know what to do. Because otherwise your instinct is to move the knight, which is fine. But the best move here is what? Who knows what black can play here? It's actually to counterattack white's knight with d4, yeah. Yeah, counterattacking white's knight. That is the cleanest path to equality here. And this leads to sort of mutually assured destruction, takes, takes. And then if you continue calculating, you'll see that black can take on d2 with check. And that check is what allows black to survive the mutual destruction of forces. Yeah, there's no four queens. Like, taking on g7, taking on b2 doesn't make sense, because white's going to make a queen, and then he's going to capture the queen on a1. <laughs> but there are some four queen lines. That's That does happen in some other openings. Okay, f takes e7. Again, um, the, he's playing this very well. Uh, so c takes d2, check. Then we capture on e7, and it's equal. All right, it's, it's a completely equal position. It's symmetrical pawn structure, if you think about it. He takes with the queen, then we should go into the end game. Let's see what he does. Yeah, it's a nice line. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, if you're attuned to these kinds of ideas, then, then it'll be natural. So here, I think some of you might be attracted to the possibility of taking the pawn with check, but you know what I always say. This is one of the refrains from the early part of the speedrun. It's like making moves just because they pose a threat or are delivered with check, which is essentially the same thing, that is a source of many mistakes because that should not in and, in and of itself be a reason for playing the move. There, should, there has to be a secondary reason. And queen takes c7 is actually very detrimental to black's position. Can somebody explain to me why that is? Why should we go into the end game? Why is queen takes c7 risky? Like, why can't we? Well, we can play it. It's fine. It's not great. It blocks the bishop. But you might be like, well, what hasn't white blocked his bishop? Well, it's not symmetrical. White's going to have a much easier time castling short. Black is going to have a very hard time castling short. And that's a problem because your king might get caught in the crossfire. Does that make sense? So you can play bishop e7 here. But the, the most clinical is just to take the queen and then play bishop takes e7. Yeah, exactly. Now we'll recapture, we'll de recapture by developing. All right, takes. So dead equal. Very well played. Castles is great. He's playing this super well. And, well, we shouldn't reinvent the wheel here. We, we castle. This is what I would call a queenless middle game. It's, you know, two rooks and three pieces versus two rooks and three pieces. It's not quite an end game yet. Knight f3 is good. What should we do now? How should we, how should we develop? And one of the key principles for queenless positions, right, is the absence of principles. You often shouldn't change the way that you play just because queens are off. The same rules apply development, active, active development, um, good positioning of pieces. And knight c6 is fine. But the small, subtle thing I would notice here, knight c6, bishop b5, is a little bit annoying, right? A little bit annoying, you might take the knight. And here's the other important rule. Pawn structure becomes a lot more important when the queens are off the board. Very important. You, you know that I de-emphasize pawn structure with the queens off the board, pawn structure on all sides of the board becomes important because, of course, you get a greater probability of eventual transition to a pawn endgame. So I would propose um, to do the same thing to white and go bishop g4. All right. So I would play bishop g4 first. Keep this knight on b8 for now. Maybe we'll put it on d7. Or maybe white will go here, which is quite likely. That's what somebody, you know, this rating might be thinking. It's not a bad move. Bishop f4 is, is a great move, though. Okay. So he is attacking the pawn. But as with the middle game, in middle game, do you automatically like react to every threat that you are faced with? Not necessarily, right? Sometimes you do. Sometimes you sacrifice stuff for initiative, and you can do the same thing in the end game, although it's harder to pull that off. 
So I, I after the game, I'll explain a move such as knight c6. That would be a very interesting move. But in this game, in this uh, with black, we're trying to play very solidly. So let's, for the purposes of solid play, let's defend the pawn with c6. That takes away the square from the knight, but that's okay because the knight has d7 as a perfectly legitimate development square. And it's not that essential to put it on c6 here. h3. This guy is playing very well, so h3 is good. Now, there is a bit of an issue with taking the knight on f3. That issue is that it takes away a defender from the d7 square, making it very difficult for us to develop the knight then to d7. So we need to preserve the bishop because that is the sort of conduit that allows the knight to get out. We don't want our queen side to be undeveloped. So where should we put this bishop? I actually propose a pretty radical move here because the issue with putting it on e6, that's the natural square, is that in the same issue with bishop f5, by the way, white can bother that bishop by centralizing his knight, knight d4. If we put the bishop on d7, we take that square away from the knight. We also blunder the bishop because he can take the knight. So we are going to go bishop c8. Now, I know that that is not an easy move to play. We're slightly worse here. He's playing this super well, but sometimes you have to make these kinds of damage control moves, right? Because that allows us to develop the knight. Watch what happens. Knight d7. Then we're going to get the knight onto a civilized square, and then we're going to reopen... Uh, you know, we're going to reopen the businesses. We're going to get the bishop out. So I know that this looks really weird, but that's the luxury of this kind of position. Because it's an endgame or a queenless middle game, the, there, is, there isn't the same immediacy, right? You can take a, long, a longer time developing your pieces and in doing so ensure that you're not getting harassed by your opponent. Okay. Now, I'm not telling you that you should always retreat a piece back to its initial square. Those moves can be very damaging. But I think you can see the logic here, and I'll explain this in greater detail after the game. All right. This is a pretty instructive moment. We were worse after bishop c8. I think g4 was not a good move by him, though. Yeah, well, that knight's blocking the bishop. Yeah, well, we'll 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 discuss that already here. Yeah, again, the specific lines. I can't make moves during the game, so I know you're into it, and he's disconnected, unfortunately. But I I promise I'll explain this stuff after the game. Thank you for the hundred bits. No, 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 pin the elder. Oh, well, you're obsessed with being with pinning, <laughs> but I'll explain that too. And that is the same reason why we didn't take the knight. Yeah, he's disconnected. He's about to lose on time in 10 seconds. Jeremy Fish, thank you for the prime. Thank you, everybody, for the support. I really appreciate everybody who subs and supports by engaging. All of the subs really, really help. I always appreciate it. Thank you, guys. And another one, Sir289. Unfortunately, he is disconnected. Yeah, that, that really sucks. Uh, because he was playing an excellent game. Okay. So, still, we have a very instructive moment to talk about. And he's slightly better in this position. He's slightly better in this position. Yeah, so I agree with you. Probably bishop e6 would have been better here. But I wanted to really show the moment there. Okay. So, one moment, please. Yeah. Now, Alakine, d5, e5, d4. That is one of the downsides of the Alakine, is there is this lackluster endgame that occurs. This endgame can occur in a different way here. This is also a line. Takes, takes, takes. You get a similar position this time, Bishop is Fian Kedod. Also, a little bit of a boring endgame. But here's what I want to make very clear. Those of you who are really ambitious, want to get good, you have to know how to play these kinds of positions. You cannot entirely avoid boring positions, nor should you try to. You can at a very like a beginner level, but eventually you get into a position where no matter how sharp your opening repertoire, there are boring lines against everything. And with black, you can face the London system. So embracing these positions and detecting the subtleties within them, there is a certain kind of beauty to that. And uh, obviously I find these end games to be as distasteful as most people, but I've sort of trained myself to appreciate 
the subtleties in them. Embrace the ennui. Um, so takes, 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 takes. Castles, castles, knight f3, and bishop g4. I can, yeah, I can second that course by Brian. He's a good friend of mine. He's, he's awesome. I mean, he's an NM, so you might bat an eye at that. You know, why isn't he a GM? He's a huge Alakine specialist, and he knows how to analyze. Um, okay, so bishop g4, bishop f4, and really the key moment was here. All right, now, first of all, we could have sacrificed the pawn. And in a real game, I would have played knight c6, and if bishop takes c7, I would have considered something like rook c8 and then you know, knight b4, and we get a pretty big initiative in return for the pawn, but that was something to consider. We played c6. Now, the key position, right? So first of all, bishop h5 is the really the instinctual answer. What's the issue with bishop h5? And this, it's exactly the same as the issue with bishop takes f3. Who can explain that to me? And it's simpler than some of you may be making this out to be. Now, yes, you ruin white's pawn structure here. You can't move the knight. That's a disaster. That is a disastrous thing, because your entire queen side, the, you know, the train car, has gotten disattached from the train. White can finish his development and start harassing you down the center. Can you pop a thing with a tier one? You can't develop the knight. If you go knight a6, you allow rook d7 with a crushing fork. If you try to go rook d8, trying to, that's probably the best move. That doesn't help. White can go bishop c4. And still you can't develop the knight. Because if you look at this very carefully, you will notice that the rook defends the knight. And this rook can be attacked with bishop c7, winning material. So that's the issue with these two moves. So we have to keep the bishop on this diagonal. If bishop e6, according to the computer, this was better than what I did. The move that bothered me is knight to d4. Harassing the bishop, threatening to capture it and ruin black structure. And again, make it impossible for the knight to develop. Um... And Artie Beer suggested bishop d5, but the bishop is not stable here. We've talked about this in the previous game. You, this might look very solid, but it's not stable because of because of the simple c4, yeah. And if you go bishop e4, boom, boom, undefended, undefended, simple pin, rookie one. So you have to go back to e6. That's not that bad. You could argue that, well, you've gotten the pawn to move out to c4, making it harder for the bishop to develop. I think you guys can all see that this is not a very desirable situation. Again, you can't really develop the knight. So that was my rationale here because behind playing bishop c8. Because what I thought was, well, he can't really stop me now from developing the knight. I'm going to get the knight to b6 or f6, and then we're going to redevelop the bishop, which is much easier to develop than the, than the knight. There's more options. However, had he played bishop c4, I might not have had the time to do what I wanted to do. And I actually kind of missed this because knight d7, he gets his rook out. You can see how active white's pieces are here. Still, it's very solid for black. It's actually hard to make something happen here, but this is not a fun position at all. Nevertheless, we can get the knight out, and then we get the bishop out, and we slowly try to neutralize the initiative. Chess is a hard game, but hopefully you were able to trace the logic here. Yeah, we could have gone c5. But I don't like that move. That's very weakening. Although I see what you're saying. You want to, you want to preserve the c6 square. I, I like it from that perspective. But it creates that weakness on d5. You see what I'm saying? It's like it creates a lot of holes in the position. So I thought that this was the lesser evil to go c6. All right. Yeah, the simple nuances take the cake here. And that those nuances are not based in some sort of crazy concepts that nobody knows it's a matter of combining logic that can be hard to sort of understand initially all right let's do one more i feel like i i should you know the support is awesome so i'm feeling i'm feeling one last game is there a particular reason you opted into the queen trade are there any other decent lines out of the opening no worries um no i do like focusing that's a great question uh yes so you can play e5 and transpose into a vienna You'd have to know those lines, though, Vienna Gambit or Four Knights Defense. Or um, you could also refrain from d4, think of vd. That could come in, in various forms. You can play Knight fd7. This transposes potentially to a French two knights. Or this move e6. That is a very dangerous pawn sacrifice. That's why I didn't do it. You could also go Knight e4. As far as I know, um, Knight e4 is okay. 
But this gets a little bit risky, this pawn is weak. So you could investigate this. I don't know where the current theory stands in this. I do know d4 is the most reputable move, but you could definitely conduct your investigations and certainly you could uh, get decent positions against your, your opponent. You're not playing Magnus Carlsen here. All right, guys. Um, let's continue. And we have another black game against Avistone. And uh, why don't we play another Alakine? Let's hope he doesn't go knight c3. Let's hope he goes e5. Paid to win, another gifted to Thiaguinho, 89, thank you. And he plays e5, nice. So of course knight d5, that's the that's the idea. The ultimate hypermodern opening. Literally the epitome of hypermodern openings, the Alakine, where you literally say, I'm going to not develop my pieces for like four moves and try to get you to overextend your center. Okay, so that's a move. It's not the best move. We'll talk about the theory afterward. Uh, but it does attack the knight. And this knight in the Alakine often belongs on what square? Knight to b6, yeah. And the bishop has to move back, so he kind of loses the tempo there. And after the bishop moves back, that, that's when we press on the gas pedal, right? We don't want to... Okay, bishop b2. That's a little bit passive. And our strategy doesn't really change. We have this pawn on e5. One of the elements of hypermodern openings is that when your opponent overextends the center, you can use the pawns as hooks, helping you to contest the central control and, you know, at the same time develop your pieces. So knight c6 is possible here, but the most accurate move is what? Thank you, Mulefish. You should play either d5 here or the more thematic move is to play d6, immediately saying, I want to get rid of this pawn. If I do get rid of this pawn, then white has really no central control. There's no reason why it is better. I'll talk about knight c6 after the game. Okay, he goes d4 to his credit. He's trying to fight for the center. Um, but now knight c6 makes more sense because in combination with moving the pawn, we talked about this, don't let your pieces get trampled on by your opponent's pawns. The way you prevent that is by combining piece moves and pawn moves, making sure that the pawns act as the kind of anchors. Right, that stop your opponent's pawns from progressing. So if knight c6, d5, is that a problem? Before we play knight c6, let's figure that one out. Is d5 a problem there? Look at that position very carefully. It is not, because that loses control of e5 and drops the pawn. Boom. He can take and play d5, but that is no longer, that is also not a big problem for the same reason. Knight f3 instead. Now we need to transform the position. What should we do? Now, the obvious move is bishop g4, and there's nothing wrong with it. But in the in the sort of spirit of positional chess, we should take this opportunity to take on e5 and go into an endgame. And the point is not to go into an endgame. The point is that after he takes with a pawn, if they take with a knight, the knight takes d4 and wins a pawn. But if he takes with a pawn, and he does, we, we take the queen. And this pawn on e5 becomes a huge weakness. So now we see the whole point behind openings like the Alakine, well, at least one of the ideas, that the center is overextended. He has more central control than we do, but he's going to probably end up losing this pawn, or he's going to have to ruin his pieces in order to preserve the pawn. What should we do? How do we put pressure on this pawn? Well, what's defending it, right? The knight. Can we pressure the knight? First, we should go bishop g4. We shouldn't go e6. That would be passive. It would lock the bishop behind the pawns. Boom. Later, we'll go e6. Okay. Very important moment. Do not just grab on f3 and grab on e5. Um, why is that bad and what should we do to remedy that? Because it drops the pawn on b7. I'll tell you what, even if it didn't, I wouldn't be so sure that giving up this bishop on g4 is such a great idea, even if it meant winning the pawn. The torture of, and that's where the threat is stronger than the execution comes from. The fact that he has to constantly deal with this pawn being weak uh, can often be a more effective strategy than actually just winning the pawn and then letting him uh, relieve, relieving him of this of this duty. So instead we should castle long, defending the pawn on b7, putting pressure on the bishop, thereby mobilizing the knight. So now we are threatening to take on f3. We probably will, given the opportunity. But we could also consider just continuing the pressure with e6. Okay. He's probably going to go bishop f4, but we'll see. 
I guess that he, I think that he will recognize the problem here. And if he goes bishop f4, then, then we'll play e6, just developing. Okay. He's thinking, he recognizes the issue, I think. Yeah, these are tough, tough, okay, knight d2, yeah, so, so that's, uh, that's sort of panic, right? 500, thank you so much, msd5, 510. So what do we do? Yeah, knight g5 would have dropped the bishop, because there, there are two, two defend, two attackers on it. Yeah, so we win the pawn. Let's take the bishop for it. We could even take on e5, but why travel to g4 when you can avoid it? Let's just take. And also this puts the white rook in a pin. Okay. Now I'm taking a second, just making sure that moves like these might even be stronger, but he can get his knight out to a3 and defend, so let's take the pawn instead. But no, notice that I took a second there to check, and now we, we just need to play e6. We need to get our bishop out. He, he is, yeah, 94, that's a good move. Untangling. Now, we could take the rook, it's not, it doesn't really matter. Um, we could also just develop our bishop. I like the concept of just developing. Most of the time, um, this concept of, that I call trading on your own terms forces your opponent into making these uncomfortable decisions. Yeah, so bishop b, well, bishop c5 alone is the bishop. Bishop b4 would be good in different circumstances. But here the knight is defended by the other knight, so he could just chase the bishop with a3. So in this particular situation, the, the, the point of getting the bishop out is more to connect the rooks than anything else. So I've made this point before on the five-minute speedrun. It is okay, um, you know, as I've said a million times, that not all of your pieces are climbing Mount Everest at every moment. The bishop b7 is fine. It restricts the e4 and it controls g5 and a thousand bits from pin the elder. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Love the support. Okay, so it also controls the d8 square, which would help us in the event of a trade. Bishop f4 is fine. He attacks our knight. Where should the knight go? We can make a move with tempo here. So one possibility is knight c4. That's that's interesting. But I like in the sort of alakine, kg alakine spirit going knight g. This sets a trap. If he goes bishop g3, he loses a piece. That is very likely. It's very likely that he does that. He also might go here, but no, oh, bishop e3, okay, he sees it. That doesn't exactly bring him a lot of relief, but we can still try that same thing. So that knight on e4, it's almost been a, a recurring theme today. Pieces being in the center, but still being susceptible to getting trampled over by pawns. So knight c4 is a great move. But we could try to go straight for the straight for the kill here with f5, attacking the knight. And you will see that the knight doesn't have too many good squares. Because no these two squares put the knight in contact with the bishop on e7, which we put there for a reason. And the only piece defending that knight is the bishop. That would be a type 2 undefended piece. Those are very vulnerable, and if he goes there, we will find a way to dislodge the bishop from e3. But if he goes knight d2, then he makes his, his position even more passive. And uh, that's a pretty big win for us. Okay. He takes. That's great. We'll take. Yeah, knight c5. So I will say that he found a very creative solution here. So yeah, knight e, so he. What he does is he attacks e6. If we go f4, he might play knight takes e6, counterattacking our rook. So unfortunately, we need to calculate some variations here. f4, knight takes e6. We take his bishop. He takes our rook. What should we do in that position? Should we take the knight immediately? Do we have any intermediate moves? Yeah, we do have an intermediate move. Bishop c5 is interesting, but you can just play e takes f2 check, dispensing with the pawn and then taking his knight. We have a bishop and a knight for the rook. That's a pretty big advantage for black because he doesn't have any pawns for it. But I've previously shared with you guys the idea that when you've got a two pieces for a rook scenario, when, when there's no other pair of rooks on the board, that usually favors the side with the rook. But in this particular instance, the minor pieces are super active. So we are actually going to go for it. And also the reason I want to go for it is 
to show you guys how to play with such a material imbalance, which is actually super common. Um, so even if this is not what I would have done in a real game, I still feel like it's worth worthwhile. Yeah, so he takes, could have star opponent. He's playing very, very well. Um, he's playing very well. He might be worried about this pawn, so he might take on e3, I don't know, we'll see. Yeah, so he, he does, he takes. So now if we, if we want to be extra accurate, you know, if we want to really be surgical in our precision, what should we do? And I've, I'm wrong, uh, but I still want to do this. Improve the position of the bishop. If he treats this well, this is actually not as good as it looks. But again, I want to show you guys the principle. You're always on the hunt for intermediate moves, which can come in two different forms. Intermediate moves can be tactical, but they can also be positional, like improving the position of the bishop and then taking the knight. Okay, so the king should go up to e7, of course. There's no other good square. He made a small error by bringing his king backward. That's not what you should do in the end game. That's not really a pointless joke. He trades the knights. Okay, fair enough. We have a I love that we have this imbalance, right? We have bishop and knight against rook with equal pawns. First of all, he's attacking the bishop. Let's drop it back in order to attack the pawn. In these kinds of situations, peace activity decides everything. Absolutely every, the result of the game is decided by the, the side that is able to activate their piece or pieces um, with greater efficiency. Now that is a, a blunder, he gives us a free pawn and maybe he's relying on rook h5, in which case we have a very sexy idea. We have a very sexy idea if he finds rook h5, which would fork the bishop and the pawn. I think he will find this. And what's that sexy idea? How do I even find this? Well, when the rook is in a corner like this, right? You often, rooks are, it, they seem to be invincible, but it's not knight f4, that blunders the bishop, don't blunder the bishop, uh, but it is bishop f4. The thing with the rooks is that they, they can be trapped. You know, your rook can get trapped by minor pieces in the right set of circumstances. Yeah, bishop h6. Rook is trapped, this is covered by the knight. Team effort, h file is covered by the bishop. And the trapping will be done by the king, which will walk to g8. He can try to put ram this pawn up the board, but he doesn't have enough time. And that's jail, and that's death row, that's it. We're walking into g8, don't pre-move it, because he might take the knight, boom. It's, it's This is a brutal idea, brutal idea. Yep. Yeah, that's that's just that's one of those painful things that, that catch you out of the blue. All right, it's over. He's got to take the bishop. This guy is playing really well, um, but now it's over. We're up a full knight. Let's go ninety-five check. Just win the pawn. Bring the knight back, and then there's many ways to win this position. All right. He's probably gonna go here. No, let's bring the king up. The simplest is we're gonna bring the king either up here. Yeah, so he just gives us access to this pawn and then we're gonna just push the h pawn. Had I, yeah, king g5. Had he gotten here, I would have just created a pass pawn and distracted his king. Yeah, resigns. Great game, um, Abby Stone. Okay, so. Let's take a quick look before I head to bed. That's the alloc. So bishop c4 is suboptimal. Um, the main line is d4, then black plays d6, and white plays c4. And you get this kind of position. Black can take with either pawn. Um, cd is the more adventurous move. And this is something I'm going to talk about later. I just I'm kind of tired right now, and I'll we'll play the alloc a lot more and. We'll discuss the intricacies of the main line. Hey, that's Eva. Eva gifting up 10 subs to the community. The 4 a.m. hive, that's what we're talking about. Thank you, Eva. Appreciate it. So much support. Evax Taffy. Damn, girl. Let's go. Loving it, loving it. Thank you. Okay. So I can, in the meantime, recommend Brian Till. This is chessable, of course. It is phenomenal. The Alakine is a great weapon. 
If you're in the 16, 1700 range, you want to spice up your repertoire, both positional and tactical. Alakine is great, as is Evex. Okay, knight b6, bishop, b, bishop b2 passive, he should have gone bishop b3, and now d6. Now, don't overthink this move. We're simply trying to get rid of the e5 pawn, control some of the center, and open up our bishop, right? That's just a developing move. d4, stubborn, knight c6. Now, we could have started with knight c6, but this, and, and here played, and this transposes. But what we don't want to do, right, this play move like e6, this is where it's very easy to slip into passivity. Now our bishop is very unhappy. Thank you, Tom Hawker. And we're letting white essentially trample over us in the center here. White builds up this, this triangle. And uh, we're very passive here. So the downside of openings like the Alakine is if you don't know how to play them well, you will constantly, and maybe some of you guys have experienced this, you'll constantly get run out of the gym. You'll, you'll slip into very passive positions and you'll be miserable. So it's very, t it's like two polar opposites either, and there's people who are very passionate about the Alakine, they love it. Um, but then there are people who try and they're like, this sucks, right? That's the problem with these kinds of openings. Well, uh, big ol' Schwifty, I, I think you're thinking of it the wrong way. I think you shouldn't think of d6 as some sort of special move. It's just control some of the center, it opens the bishop, like that's a typical developing move. It's commonly played in all openings. All right, so d6, d4, knight c6, knight f3. Now we decide to take on e5. We trade queens, and he should have, at this point, taken on d6 and then gone c4, which sort of resembles the main line. Tempo up for us, we, and then we feed and get with this bishop. But okay, knight f3, boom, 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 boom. Bishop g4. Yeah, he should have gone bishop f4, probably either here or here. Knight f2 was just way too passive. And after bishop f4, we would go e6 and maybe get this bishop out, maybe bring the knight to d5. White is just very uncomfortable because this pawn is a permanent weakness. It's sticking out like a sore thumb. It's weakening a lot of these squares and black is slightly better. Okay, um, so if there are any questions here, feel free. So here he gives us the pawn and e6, knight d4, bishop e7, covering these squares, developing the bishop. Bishop f4, knight g6. And there was one little issue. I think a new bow. Well, here's a hype train. 12, 3, 3, 8, 8, the tier 1. Knight c, knight c4, he had knight b5. And I was looking at these kinds of lines. This is actually checkmate. We would have gone c6 here, but I felt like this was a little unpleasant. And another sub. TH3, MT0, and 100 bits by music. I see what you guys are trying to do. All right. So instead, we decided to go knight g6. Active retreating move, bishop b3. Had he gone bishop g3, as I, I hinted, boom. And boom, and the bishop is trapped. This is very simple. Kenji Papa, a sub, and Ryan Ellis boy, a sub. What is going on here, ladies and gentlemen? Thank you, guys. Yeah, so that's just completely winning. So he goes bishop e3. We go f5. And, you know, I explained this during the game, right? We're trying to dislodge the knight from e4, and it is no good place to go. Music by JM gifting a sub to Etho Thoi. All right. Takes, takes, knight c5. Now, had he gone knight c5 immediately, that would have been very inaccurate. Who can explain to me why this move is less accurate than what he did? Curious chimpanzee is sub to trans tabla. Oh my god, 5,000 bits from Evax Tavi. What is this? Who is this? 200 Hamichiko. Oh my lands, that is crazy. Thank you, Evax. You are insane. Smashing level two. Yeah. So who can figure this out before I was rudely distracted by that cheer? <laughs> Thanks, Evax, I appreciate it. Music with 100 bits. Yeah, so the problem is if we play F4 here, guys, that's the same thing as in the game, right? Boom, boom, boom. That transposes. But where does this take its power? This takes its power from the fact that the knight attacks the rook, right? Otherwise, this would just be a pawn and we would capture the bishop. So, yeah, Odrama, Odrama Lao gets it. Very nice. We would take on d1 here, sneaky piece of the 100. And then we would play f4. And you might look at this and say, well, why are we giving up the open file? Well, that's not the point. Tactics always trumps these general considerations. Bishop d4, e5, 
the bishop is trapped and if the bishop moves back then we take the knight and if knight takes c6 then we just take the bishop you see what i'm saying so it was actually a very good decision for him to take the rook first knight c5 and that forces us to win this position oh my god zoidbar for another 10 gifted subs what is going on here ladies and gentlemen this is ridiculous another 10 gifted wow now this is getting crazy i gotta disable the alerts now because this was going on youtube thank you zoidbarf i really appreciate it this this is crazy okay so bishop c5 check and hoax thank you for the tier one now well, thank you now he went backward to f1 which is fine but i probably should have gone forward to f3 and knight to king takes d so here he sort of collapsed now that he decided to trade the knights which was not particularly good this knight on c3 should have gone to e4 that's the reason why this bishop on c5 is actually kind of a sitting duck thank you raheem gunner 49 and we would have dropped the bishop back and you know the end game would have gone on but instead rook d1 check knight d5 check takes takes and bishop back to d6 so here he makes the decisive mistake giving up the pawn c4 is a good thought he should have played h3 how would we have proceeded in this kind of position like what is what do we even think about what do we do that's what i think overwhelms people about these types of end games it's not just not clear how to manage the pieces here what's even the plan and that's entirely the point there is no clear plan here um and it's not like you don't know something about the position all you should be focusing on here is just marginally improving the pieces pushing pawns carefully to grab space but not doing it in a way that weakens them so i would start with king e6 it's not science here there's many good moves then i would maybe centralize the knight you see what i'm doing then let's say that we're, we're trying to go to c4 with a fork let's say that white goes b3 for example now i would say well that creates some weaknesses on the queen side that's where we want to try to attack with our minor pieces so one option here is to consider well, what would, who can propose a move here like what what should we do so one plan that, that already clarifies is to push the pawns on the queen side but in a particular kind of way let's start with a5 our plan is and this is called fixing the weakness let's say that white puts up no resistance to the plan you know whatever we're gonna make random moves our ultimate target position is this a pawn on a3 this pawn is anchored by the bishop it's untouchable N nothing is going to happen to this pawn even in the event of a friggin apocalypse it's going to be there and this pawn on a2 on the other hand is very weak if we win that pawn this pawn on a3 might become a queen and now our plan is to get this knight to what square to either or where not the bishop to b4 yeah but the knight to b4 and the knight to c3 and that's going to be possible through this maneuver so what's going to happen is white is going to have to tie down the rook to the defense of the pawn and then we're going to use our pieces so you guys can see sort of the general gist of this you never win these positions fast you need to do it step by step and you need to do it in a way that in a very careful way you, you don't want to create weaknesses right so that would be one idea or another idea would be to go you know, knight c6 and knight before immediately try to get white's pawns to go forward and then weaken them stuff like that okay so i don't want to talk too much about this i know it's these are tough concepts so c4 bishop h2 and now we win another pawn this game is basically over he can refrain from taking the pawn but that's pretty vast material advantage and once he takes it you go bishop h6 and you trap the rook so that's um a very nice pattern and then we bring the king in and win the game so he took the bait i mean at this point there's very little that can be done create weaknesses and isolate them yeah improving the activity of your pieces and of course pass pawns and symmetrical pawn structures um and i have a game to finish with and I won't play another one, guys. It is very late. I'm commentating tomorrow at, at noon Eastern with Robert. I got a lot of things to do before then. But I do have one game to show you on the topic of end game planning and clearing, creating, and fixing weaknesses. So here is a good game on the topic. Okay. Um, this is from 2007. This is my, my chess career. And this was a pretty. This is a game. This was a transformative game for me because. It, the plan that I applied in this game, I was like, girl, I actually can do this kind of stuff, which I had seen in like Grandmaster games. And I heard fixing the weakness 
and my eyes would glaze over that. I'm fixing the weakness. That's something like Karpov does, right? But it's it's not rocket science, and I convinced myself of that with this next game. One sec. So this was California State Championship, K through 12, 2007. I was in sixth grade. Um, so good old days. And uh, yeah, this is round three. So I'm 21, 25. I'm playing in 1800. And it's black to play. So we got a night end game with equal material. Um, and it's not entirely, it's not immediately transparent who is better. Well, it kind of is, if you know what to look for. You should look for piece activity. Who's got the more active pieces? Not a trick question. Of course, it's black. I mean, look, look at the despair. Knight on d4 is tying down white's knight. That's great. You've got a weakness. You're tying it down. Of course, it's black. The king is good. White's king is good, but it's sort of... Its power is limited by the fact that I have a passer on f6 um, that is, you know, potentially going to be very valuable. But I started to think here, I couldn't find for a long time, for the life of me, a plan to win the game. You play to win the game. I didn't see how to break through, because if, if I give a check on e2 and try to get the knight around c1, he actually starts hunting for my pawns. I didn't want to allow this. Black can easily lose this game if you allow white to take the h7 pawn. That gets fast. So I wanted to keep the knight on d4. You could play h6, but white's going to just shuffle the king between e4 and d4. e4 and f4. And then finally, I found, I had an aha moment and I found the plan. And fixing the weakness, that is the key to winning this position. Bingo. a4. That is correct. Where is this pawn going? He goes king e4. Boom. Not only are you fixing the weakness, you're carving out. You're carving out the c3 square, but that square is only meaningful in light of the fact that there is a pawn on a2 that is going to be the weakness, which is fixed. And he cannot stop me because of his passive pieces uh, from getting the knight to c3, winning the pawn and promoting. That literally nothing that he can do about it. He desperately tries to, but I play knight takes c2, I win this pawn. That's not the point though. Then I come back to b4, take a2. Look at how the king fully limits the knight, and that was that. And he resigned in this position. So it's as simple as that. If you look at this position initially, you might think it's close to a draw. This is a very powerful end game plan. Now, if he had tried to go a3 and preempt me, then he, you know, it's the same concept. Now the pawn is fixed on a3, you can go knight b5. The, white is losing, I mean, this is, there's no defense here. You can go b3 check, Probably that's the best move. I think there's no defense. I'm not sure. Maybe there is. I haven't analyzed this game in a long time, but now you can start collecting these pawns. Okay. Does that make sense? And is are there any questions? Okay. Looks like everybody's clear. All right, guys. I think that we've got a lot of viewers, but it is time to, for, for me to call it a day. I have to go to sleep. Otherwise, I will not be um, coherent tomorrow at noon because we are covering with my partner in crime, Robert the uh, Magnus Tour, and that's going to be a lot of fun. I hope to see you guys there. Um, I will not be able to commentate every day. I think I'm going to have to skip next week, and I'll be traveling back to California visiting family, but I'll be doing it as much as I can. I'll be doing it tomorrow, probably on Tuesday. I'll be skipping Thursday, so I'll keep you guys posted. Uh, there will be days when Robert does the commentary alone, but I will be there tomorrow at noon Eastern, uh, on my stream, Twitch stream, and on Robert's Twitch stream, uh, we will be back together to commentate the Magnus Store, bringing it to you guys. We'll explain more tomorrow. And with that, let's pause the cameras. Could somebody let me know? Actually, let me go to Twitch and see who I can raid. Um, I'm going to go full cam here for just a second. Yeah, thank you guys for the support, Evax Toffee, everybody for the tons of gifted subs and the tons of support. Yeah, maybe I should raid Ludwig. Should I raid Ludwig? Just rub it in <laughs> a little bit. Well, let me see. I don't see anybody who's streaming. So we might just have to make it a Ludwig raid kind of day. We might just have to. Oh, he's got a 24 hour stream. Nice. All right, let's raid Ludwig. I really appreciated the fact that he and Charlie made the time for the event. That will go on YouTube as well. All right, let's raid Ludwig. It's just Ludwig, right? That's his Twitch channel. It's just Ludwig. It's not. It's just Ludwig, right? 
Yeah, it's just Ludwig. Okay, guys. Thank you so much, everybody. Stay safe, folks. Take care. See you tomorrow at 12. Rating Ludwig. Bye for now.